Well, it is really good to have the chance to worship with you, uh, my people. I was at Berkeley yesterday for a competition and, and was looking around at just swarms of people and, and certainly felt compassion for them and was curious about them, but thought, tomorrow morning I'm going to be with my people, and here I am. So it's just great to sing and to, to sing praise to our King. Let me start with this. Uh, the actors, Arnold Schwarzenegger and, and Danny DeVito, made news recently during this live event for Interview Magazine. Schwarzenegger said flatly that heaven is a fantasy, and that's what made news. See, when somebody asked him, well, Arnold, what happens after we die? And he said, nothing. You're six feet under, and anyone who tells you anything else is a liar. And then he, he went on, we don't know what happens with the soul and all that spiritual stuff that I'm not an expert in, but I know that the body, as we see each other in now, we will never see each other again like that. And that's the sad part. And then Danny DeVito chimed in with, yeah, we just deteriorate. But what really struck me about this, this interview uh, was when Schwarzenegger, who, as you might know, was a, a former Mr. Universe and uh, a, an actor and a action movies and so on, kind of showed his softer side. And he said this, he said, I know people feel comfortable with death, but I don't. And then he said this, I will miss the expletive out of everything. To sit with you here, that will one day be gone? And that was a, a question, so maybe he's seeking. And to have fun, and to go to the gym, and to pump up, and to ride my bike on the beach, to travel around and see interesting things all over the world, what the expletive? And then Danny DeVito jumped in with this, life, it's the best. And I thought, Arnold, Danny, we at Valley Church resonate with you guys because we are not at all comfortable with death either. In fact, we hate death. Death is the last enemy. Uh, and we agree that life in a body in God's good creation is a great thing. And so uh, I got inspired, and I, I put the article down, and I, I pounded out a quick letter to Arnold Schwarzenegger and sent him a book uh, for, through his fan mail uh, 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 explaining the Bible's vision of the afterlife, which is resurrection of the body. It's not floating on clouds without a body. That's, that's the cartoon version. That, that's not true. Eternal life with God our Father involves life in a renewed Eden-like world that's both urban and rural in ways we can't possibly conceive of right now. And best thing of all, it's full of the glory of God. That's the Christian vision of the life to come. And this life is that Jesus offers is one of the main themes in this book that we've been exploring now for over a year, the Gospel of John. And life jumps off each page of the Gospel of John, starting from page one, starting from verse four, where John writes, in Jesus was life. Huge theme, life. Life, life, the Word, Jesus, He brought physical life into existence. All things were made through Him. That's John 1, 2. Because Jesus, our Savior, has life in Himself, like His Father. That's John 5, 26. And there are at least 30 verses in John that connect Jesus with this amazing multidimensional life. In fact, you know, the, the very first message in our Believe series from way back on May 29th, 2022, we called that message the lifer, putting an ER on the end of life to kind of show vocation or role. One of Jesus' main jobs or tasks is to give life to those who believe. Look at some of these verse fragments here. Verse 410 from John, I dispense the water of life. John 6, I came down from heaven to give life 
to the world. I am the bread of life, John 6.35. John 6.63, I speak words that are life. John 8.12, I am the light of life. And it's not just this ho-hum, just barely getting by kind of life, but John 10.10, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. That's what Jesus offers us. You know, the gospel of John, it's for the Arnold Schwarzeneggers and the Danny DeVitos of the world, and it's for our neighbors and our, our friends. It's about life and how to have it through the one who called himself the resurrection and the life. John eleven twenty five 25, and John 20, 31 says that this book was written so that people like Arnold and Danny and your dental hygienist and your barista and your neighbor and your aunt, okay, may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. And so if you're here this morning and you're thinking like Arnold and Danny, you know, there's no afterlife. You just deteriorate. You know, please read this Gospel of John, and we've got hundreds of them. They're out on the, 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 the welcome desk with Ron and Floyd and at the usher's desk. Just just read this, and I think what's going to happen is you're going to come alive on the inside as you read and you encounter Jesus, the life. And speaking of life, I just have to tell you a, a quick story here. Um, last Wednesday, I met with, with Lisa uh, to, and Anna to, to plan out the service, and then after our, our meeting, uh, I, I slipped out to my favorite coffee place to work on this sermon. It's my little office away from the office. I always see Tracy there. I don't know if Tracy's here today. But anyway, I walk in, and, and I see this man who, who, who is pictured here. I think I have a picture of him. I see this guy, perfect stranger, never seen him before in my life. And I notice that he's wearing this long white T-shirt, and he's got athletic shorts, and he's talking animatedly to this younger man. But there's something about this guy. It's not just the, the athletic exterior. I just sense that there's life in this guy. There's something above and beyond normal human life. And so I get my coffee and I, I sit down. Uh, the only table available is the table right next to him and his, and his friend. And I open up my computer, slip in my AirPods, start to type, and then all of a sudden I hear the phrase, the great I am. And then I just stop typing. And then I hear Moses and faith that moves mountains an eternity that never ends, and how we were created to have fellowship with God. And I think, oh, that's what I was sensing in this room. That's the power of the Holy Spirit in this guy talking about Jesus to his friend. And, and I try not to eavesdrop, <laughs> but it was impossible. And so I, I try not to, but, but I, can't, I can continue to hear, and uh, I'm just uh, amazed. It's almost as if the Holy Spirit is, is audible and visible in this man's vitality and his testimony and his burst of, of laughter at different points. And so finally, I think, well, I can't keep listening to this. I need to move across the room. So I move across the room, and then after 90 minutes, they appear to be wrapping things up, and I think, I just have to meet this guy. I got to go up and, and talk to him, and I'm hoping that when he leaves, he and his friend will get in different cars so I can actually approach him, and, and I, I walk out to my car, and then he and his friend continue the conversation at the curb. So now it becomes kind of a stalking situation, <laughs> because I'm in my car, kind of looking in the rearview mirror, just waiting for them to part. And then right at the moment they begin to part, Becky calls, <laughs> and wanting to talk about the kid's financial aid for college. And I'm thinking, Becky, this is not the right time. I'm about to meet this, this special person. And so anyway, we get off the phone. They part ways, and I, I immediately I walk up to him and almost kind of pounce on him as he's getting in his car. And I say, excuse me, I, say, I just couldn't help but overhear some of your conversation. You have to be a believer in our Lord Jesus Christ. And wow, he just lit up. It just lit up. And uh, we, we talked, and he said, he said yeah, and, and uh, we introduced ourselves. And I said, just the way you were sharing your faith in Jesus and with so much spirit-filledness and, and joy. And I, just, I said, I was touched by what I saw, and then he wanted to know about me. I said, well, I'm a pastor who just works right down the street here at this church, and, and then we exchanged phone numbers, and we've been texting for the last few days back and forth. And uh, he gave me his testimony, and I won't tell you that now. I'm hoping maybe have him come and share his testimony one of these days. But anyway, just a couple of little things. Community Bible study leader, prayer warrior, uh, a lot of kids and grandkids, but he wrote this. He said, my goal is to grow in Christ, encourage the brethren, and be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks for the reason for the hope that is in me. 
And he said, Darren, how can, how can I pray for you? And I gave him a few things. And then he said, hey, I'm, getting, I'm leaving town, but when I get back, let's get together. And then he said this, and this is what really touched me too, based on this theme we're already exploring. He said this in his text, life is good and the best is to come. And I thought, if I could just get Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVigo in the same room with Ron Von Stieg, that's his name, for one hour, it'd be over for Arnold and Danny because of the life in him and this, and this testimony. Okay, well, all that just to kind of set the stage um, for this the theme for today. I'm sorry I'm kind of prattling on here. But, but we've seen in this series, John has made it clear that to give this life to the world, this life that animates Ron von Stieg, the eternal life that death can't touch, Jesus the life giver had to give his life. He is the lifer and he is the dyer. And he came into the world for that purpose, to give his life. In fact, I, I just close, this is a little close-up of Ron's phone here. And look what he has uh, as a graphic on the back of his phone. He's got a, a, lot of, a little cross, which I noticed after the fact. Ron's spiritual life came through his Lord's death because Jesus came single-mindedly to give his life for us. And we'll see that very clearly in today's story of his betrayal and his arrest in the garden. And, and, and John, the, the writer, is an artist with a pen. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he wants us to see certain features and characteristics of Jesus. So we're going to see about five things today. And the big idea is this, is that John depicts Jesus as the master and commander of his death for us. John wants us to see that Jesus is master and commander. And here's how we're going to see it here. He wants us to keep this big thought in mind as we look at these verses here. First two verses really set the scene here. It's when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. When Jesus exits the upper room with the 11, as we know, uh, Judas had gone out into the night, and you can check out this picture. He walks down these stairs from the southern part of the Temple Mount, and these are stairs that have been uncovered by archaeologists. You can go, and maybe you'll go with Pastor Thomas when he leads a trip one of these days. And, And like Becky and I, you can sit on these very steps that Jesus walked down that night to go down into into across the Kidron and up the Mount of Olives to the Garden of Gethsemane. And so he walked down these stairs after being in the upper room with his disciples. He walks down, down across this little brook, and then he starts to go up uh, the Mount of Olives. But as he's crossing the brook, he must have been thinking about the the rivers of lamb blood that had been flowing through that that brook and, and, and what that was going to mean for him as the Lamb of God who would shed his blood for the sins of the world. And then he goes up the Mount of Olives, and he enters this garden. And, of course, Jesus knew this, or Judas knew this place because he had been with Jesus there many times on their visits to Jerusalem. And what's significant is that this battle is going to take place in a garden because it was in a garden where the first Adam failed to trust and obey God. So it's fitting that in, it's going to be in another garden that the second Adam Adam will succeed despite being crushed like an olive in a press. And and Gethsemane is is actually not a a translation, it's a transliteration. It's it's literally uh, God Shemanim. It's two words in Hebrew mashed together to form what sounds like Gethsemane. And it's literally press of oils. This is the place where Jesus was pressed for our salvation Well, what is John saying in this portrait of Jesus? What does the artist really want us to see? Because he's bringing out certain details under the power of the Holy Spirit. Look, it's look how in control of the situation Jesus is. Here we go, verse 3 and 4. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, catch this, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward 
and said to them, whom do you seek? What John wants us to see is that what looks like chaos is not chaos at all. It is part of a carefully predetermined plan. And that's why Jesus goes to a place where he's known to go. Like Lisa just said, he wasn't hiding. He's not like some fugitive in a movie because this is his death hour and he has come to die. And notice that John tells us that Jesus knows all that will happen to him. And the tense of this verb is that he comprehended it at one point in the past and he's carrying that knowledge into the present moment. This has been with him. And we've seen this. This isn't a surprise. He's been repeatedly, all through this John series, talking about his death and talking about it in a variety of ways and a variety of figures, but he's been talking about it again and again uh, in chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 10, chapter 12, chapter 16, and chapter 17, one reference after the other to what he's come to do. And notice also that John tells us that Jesus came forward. That's a significant detail. He didn't need to be chased around the garden. He didn't need the temple police dogs to, to be let loose. They, they didn't need the torches and the troops. He came forward, and by doing so, he took his own pursuers by surprise. He's in total control of the situation. And we see it not just with his actions and coming forward, but with the words that come out of his mouth, because he says, whom do you seek? And by doing that, he's putting the attention on himself and diverting it from his disciples, which is part of his good shepherd mission and heart. And here's the point of John's picture. Jesus is calling the shots. He's orchestrating events despite the freedom of those who are acting against him. John wants us to see that Jesus is the master and commander of the situation. And he's only moving at the prompting of his father, never at the prompting of human beings. So, I just, you know, you, disciple, you might feel that some of your circumstances are a little out of control, or maybe that, that your garden in life is, is under siege, or maybe that you're, you're being surrounded by, by circumstances, or just collectively the Christian family is, is, is under siege. Uh, with people, at least with rhetorical lanterns and torches and, and, and weapons. But it's good to know as the people of God, we are perfectly safe standing behind Jesus. We are perfectly safe. There might be people, and more and more as the days grow evil, who mount attacks against believing people, but we are safe. Even against a million-man army, if we stand right behind our Savior Jesus. In fact, I want to just, this is a verse that came to mind as I was preparing. Listen to this from Isaiah. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the voice of his servant? Remember that. Let him who walks in darkness of circumstances and difficulty and pressure, let him who walks in darkness and has no light trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. You feel, maybe you feel like you're in darkness and you would love to get out of that dark situation somehow. You would like to make your own light, to illuminate the situation with some sort of action, even if it's at the expense of your ongoing active faith. Just a little defection from Jesus for some comfort, taking the easy way out. No, no, no. What Jesus is saying is stand right behind me. Don't run out in front of me. Don't run away. Just stay right there even if it feels like darkness. In fact, we were, um, we were in Palm Desert two weeks ago uh, for a little family trip, seven days together before um, Anna goes back to the Master's University and our son Ethan is starting college at Texas A&M this fall. So it was kind of a special time for us to, to be together. And on the last morning of our trip, the Saturday morning, Becky and I both read Psalm 125. And verse 2 really really grabbed us both. And I, I didn't put it on the screen, but it goes like this. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds His people from this time forth and forevermore. So this, this image 
of, of, of God, uh, being surrounded by God like the city of Jerusalem is, sound, is surrounded by mountains, it, it really spoke to me. It really reassured me. It just, somehow it just seemed to go right in. And in fact, I even wrote it down in my, my journal. And then I, I put on my running shoes and I, I took off for, for a morning run before the desert heat got too intense. And as I was running on my, my, my route, I, I, I looked up and I saw my physical environment in terms of the, the scriptural lens that I had just been looking through, and I thought, well, look here. I'm in this hot place, I'm in this desert, but look what's surrounding me on all sides of Palm Desert. There are mountains. I thought, this is really something. This is God reassuring me. Sometimes life, it's true for all of us, feels hot. It feels like it's got a lot of needles. It feels like it's a desert, desert but the Lord surrounds His people. And I took my, my run around, and I was so excited when I got back. I got on Google Maps just to check and see, and sure enough, the, these mountains are the San Jacinto Mountains to the west, and then the San Bernardino Mountains to the north, and the Santa Rosa Mountains to the south. Just incredible reassurance God gave me that even though some elements of life right now for all of us feel like a desert, the Lord surrounds His people. You know, so trusting in our God and Father and walking, standing firmly behind Him <laughs> is a perfectly safe place to be. Well, what's the second observation here that John wants us to make? It's this. It's look how closely identified He is with His Father, who is the one who controls all things. Verses 5 through 6, they answered Him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am He. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. And when Jesus says, I am he, it, it could just be a simple answer to their question, that is, I am the one you're looking for. But obviously, from the details and the circumstances, this is an indication of Jesus' close identification with the Father. We've already seen Jesus use language, the I am language that the Father uses to identify Himself all the way, ba way back in Exodus 3.14, 1,500 years before the events of, of John. Uh, Exodus 3.14, say, say to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And so when Jesus says, I am to His pursuers, they get a glimpse of the divine majesty because John reports that they're knocked off their feet, which is an often a reaction to a divine encounter, is literally getting flattened. See, they come for what they think is a, a Galilean carpenter, but they encounter the great I am. They encounter Yahweh in person. And John wants us to see that, how closely identified Jesus is with Yahweh, the master and commander of the universe. And we've seen this already in our study, right? Jesus said, I and the Father are one, John 10, 30. And whoever has seen me has seen the Father, John 14, 9. John wants us to look at this and see Yahweh in person, standing there with his disciples. And that's the reason for our confidence in him is he shares the Father's power and control. Observation number three, Look how committed he is to be our substitute. Verses 7 through 9, so he asked them again, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he, so if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Let these men go. Just look at Jesus, Yahweh in person. Notice that he only surrenders himself after he has secured his disciples' freedom and release. And isn't that a picture of the heart of the gospel, right? All take what they deserve. Yahweh in person receives willingly what his disloyal people have coming to them. And this substitution theme, him for us, it's the very heart of our story. It's the heart of our gospel. And like we said a few weeks ago, these substitution stories, they grab our hearts every time. That's why these Hollywood filmmakers are making bank using this idea of substitution. People keep coming to the movies and plunking down their 15 bucks, right? 
to see themes that relate to substitution, one person laying his or her life down for another. Why? Because it's the story at the center of the gospel. And, 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 it's the, and that is our story. John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And notice, too, the, the spiritual protection Jesus gives his disciples, ancient and modern. Look at this. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. You know, those who believe, those who listen to and follow after Jesus, however imperfectly, are forever safe. And that's what he says in John 10, 27 through 28, explicitly. He says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Believers are unsnatchable. That's what he tells us right here. Fourth observation that John wants us to make, it's this. It's look how unconventional are his methods. Verses 10 through 11, then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? And again, we see that the method of this sovereign, of this king, is unconventional by normal kingly standards. He doesn't operate the way that we see kings operate all through history. And when, when Peter decides to take matters into his own hands, using conventional methods for getting things done, right? Swords and weapons and, 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 and attack and violence. Well, Jesus rebukes him and says, no, I'm going to conquer evil by absorbing it and not by retaliating. And, I, you know, I just saw, speaking of kings, I, uh, you know, I read an article this last week about the now-in-exile Wagner Group leader, uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin. And you, you probably saw this if you followed the news. He, he got in big trouble with Putin for, uh, I guess, marching or threatening to march on Moscow before he, he turned around and uh, had to flee to another country in exile. And then one commentator said this, uh, the Game of Thrones philosophy applies here. If you go for the king, you better kill the king. Retired Admiral James Stavridis said of the news of Prigozhin's deal with the Kremlin during an appearance on Meet the Press. Well, of course, we don't need a, a, a foreign policy expert to tell us that, right? Putin will show no mercy to insurrectionists. To this fellow or anybody allied with Prigozhin is now in serious trouble because that's the way things work in normal kingly terms, right? But that's not what Jesus will do with those who marched on him. An army marched on Jesus that day, right? Normal Game of Thrones rules, if they were applying, would say, you march on this king and you meet a bad fate. Not this king. He's unorthodox. His methods are unorthodox. And we might think that, what, uh, that God would wipe out the whole Wagnerian human race, right, who marched against him in the, in the garden and have marched against him for many centuries since then. But no, Jesus operates at a totally different level of method. Suffering love is his way. It's defeating evil by absorbing it. Well, when Peter attempts recklessly to defend Jesus, you know, by, by being loyal, I, I suppose, but he's making a big mistake that I think sometimes we make, is that he wants to serve Jesus, but he doesn't want to accept Jesus as the sacrificial lamb. He doesn't want to accept Jesus as the good shepherd who lays down his life. And I think this is a trap maybe we can fall, our, fall ourselves into where we really want to be a servant of Jesus, but not be a served one of Jesus. You know, we can't be his servant unless we're always his served one. We never outgrow the need to be served by Jesus, for Him to wash our feet when we make a mess of things, and we make a mess of things a lot, right? We never outgrow that need for Him to wash us, for Him to minister to us, for Him to clean us off when we have really made uh, 
a, a, a disaster of things, and Peter had to learn that. Well, fifth observation before we do some singing, um, look how he cut our ties by being tied himself. John 18, 12 through 14, so the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Well, we're going to be in trial scenes for the next couple of weeks, so I'm not going to say much about the trials now, but this is some kind of a preliminary hearing. Uh, Annas had been the high priest, but the Romans had deposed him, but he still had a tremendous amount of, of influence. So anyways, some more on, on that and the dynamics there in the weeks ahead. But one point that John really wants us to see with his very carefully painted narrative is that they bound Jesus. They tied him. And I think what this is meant to indicate is that since the fall, humans have been tied up and bound to the forces of sin and death, all the while thinking that they're free. Um, but rather than leaving us in our enslaved position, Yahweh, again, in, in the person of his son, was bound. And he was tied so that he might cut us loose from the powers of sin and and death. The, he says, if the son who was tied sets you free, you are free indeed. One of the purposes of his death was to liberate us, was to free us. And it's so interesting that John makes it clear that this episode happens when? During Passover, when the Jews remember Yahweh's previous anticipatory work of liberation in delivering them from the powers of Pharaoh in Egypt. All that anticipated this greater deliverance of the, of the Passover. And I want to just leave you before we sing. In fact, the band could, could kind of make their way up here. I want to leave you with, with an image as we sing some freedom songs. Um, and uh, I want to introduce you to Amy Peach, okay? This is Amy Peach right here, a marionette puppet. And you can see that Amy is in really bad shape, can't you? You can see that she is torn and you can see that she is smudged, and you can see most of all that she is the plaything of the powers of sin and death, isn't she? Despite the fact that she has a smile on her face, that's all a facade, because people in their enslaved state have deep anguish for the most part, despite trying to put forward an image of freedom. Well, what this is a picture of humans outside of the redemption that Jesus offers, but what Jesus has done for those who look to him and believe is he frees the Amy Peaches of the world. He cleans them off and he cuts their strings so that they're now free to follow Jesus. And that's what he has, has done for us. And that's what we're going to sing about now for a couple of songs. And I want to just encourage you, maybe you've never had your strings cut. Maybe you're still uh, in a state of, of spiritual slavery. Maybe today is the day you say, I believe in Jesus. He is the Son of God. He is the Lamb of God who took away my sin. I believe. You know, the whole Gospel of John was written to bring people to a point of confession where they say, like Thomas, I believe Jesus is my Lord and my God. Maybe today is that day for you, and you'd like to come forward to, during, we, during the, our, our singing and you could talk to Uncle Bert or, or Andy or Richard or Frank or, or any of us. Uh, we'd love to pray with you. Maybe as we sing, um, you're aware of the fact that despite the fact that you've been liberated by Jesus, you're going back into patterns of slavery. You're letting some old strings get retied, and again, you're being manipulated by forces of, of death. And so maybe you need to ask Jesus to touch you again to have those things pushed to the side. And um, so let's worship together a couple of songs about this spiritual freedom, and then I'll come up and, and I'll close our service.